Hello, everyone. The title of my presentation today is Animation as Identity Construction in Gender Transition and Grief. My name is Jason Dennis. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am undertaking my Master of Fine Arts at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus. I'm a digital media artist, and my primary mode of art creation for this master's is digital illustration and animation. I'd like to thank the Hugs for Conference team for organizing this really great and, and varied event and having my work be a part of the presentations. Uh, first off, I want to acknowledge the land on which I currently reside and attend, UBC Okanagan. Uh, Kelowna is situated on the unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. I'm thankful to be a settler living here, but no treaty has been negotiated for this land. My presentation today will be focusing on an intersection between Jungian active imagination and contemporary expressive art therapy as it relates to a selected animated work that I have created for my MFA. I will relate the exploration of expressive art therapy and active imagination as it pertains and guides my creative process. My art explores how resulting animated visuals could construct a meaningful relationship between my personhood in gender transition to my sister's death, of connecting a new body to the past and a past body to the future. My main inquiry is, how can a relationship that never was be created through animated media? I will discuss how the process of creating an animation as a result of active imagination in tandem with expressive art therapy creates a feedback loop between the artist, that being myself, and the artwork, which precipitates a form of healing from trauma. I feel as though I have to provide some context because my MFA work has become quite interlinked with personal events and rather autoethnographical. Uh, in late 2018, I was preparing the final touches, if you will, on my very long overdue coming out as transgender speech to my family. Uh, this ended up coinciding within a week of the sudden death of my younger sister by an overdose. Um, that just came out of nowhere, completely unexpected. The result of this, of course, was that I didn't have a chance to share my authentic self with her, uh, that a new recontextualized relationship, as actually her brother I had hoped for, would never exist. This changed the direction of my MFA completely, and my new works are now created in response not only that physical loss of her, but the loss of that relationship that never was. I do also want to contextualize this loss with the beginning of my gender transition, which is quite the literal opposite set of emotions. For me personally, it has been the process of gaining life and awakening a truer, more whole person. Expressive art therapy is a bit different from other art therapy practices in that, in that it allows and encourages multiple modes of expression instead of uh, usually just one. These expressions can occur as images of grief and loss in pictures, words, movements, sounds, or dramatic enactment. Uh, depending on an evolving need, these images of loss and grief are formed and reformed or reimagined for new meaning, for creating narrative around one's healing. This way, Thompson and Berger explain, experiences do not remain senseless, silenced, unseen, immovable, or untouchable. A huge component of expressive art therapy is individual flexibility in the tools that come naturally for people in externalizing painful thoughts and experiences. Conceptualized by Carl Jung between 1913 and 1916, active imagination, as a simpler explanation, is the conscious engagement of dialogue with unconscious parts of oneself. It's different from a dream because it is the purposeful meeting of conscious and unconscious in an equal setting. This conscious participation in the imaginal event is what transforms it from mere fantasy to active imagination. It's meant to create a deeper relationship between the different parts of yourself through imagination and free-form thought. Symbolism becomes an important aspect of active imagination as it is a great tool for personifying certain aspects of the unconscious that uh, you might encounter. The creative process for my artwork mainly arose 
out of a need to cope with intrusive thoughts relating to my sister's death. That is imagery that is not wanted or summoned by choice, but is delivered to the conscious mind by the unconscious, sometimes obsessively so. Uh, that is for half of the works that are directly dealing with the, the grieving process. This would also be considered passive fantasy, as uh, Robert Johnson explains it, but for me, intrusive thoughts suits the experience more terminology-wise through active imagination, which, again, is the meeting of the conscious and unconscious. I tried to capture the shape of the intrusive imagery, how it related in my own perception to my sister, which parts were most important, which parts were the main agitators, in a sense, how do you want me to draw you? In translating my active imaginations as drawings, there was a process of there was a process of identification which came in the form of physical recognition when a sketch was close to capturing the nature of the intrusive thought. Uh, that careful awareness of the physical body was important so that I wouldn't accidentally recontextualize the unconscious imagery. Shaverian explains. Uh, art has a tangible and material existence. It records traces of the imaginal activity that produced it. Moreover, it holds and fixes at once moving and limiting the flow of the unconscious. After feeling as though I captured the intrusive imagery, I translated it again to digital illustration, uh, developing its depth and colors. This was also, I feel, a form of active imagination as I put on barely visible layer by barely visible layer, culminating to a point where my body, the unconscious, reacted with a cold chill of recognition. Uh, that sounds a bit dramatic, but this intrusive thought now existed outside of me in the physical world, and I could feel that there was a shift. In The Art of Dreamscaping, Niemeyer states, when we externalize images, we overcome the prison of privacy and move into a world of social sharing where we amplify the story and consolidate it to give it new life. Uh, this product of externalizing is very important in art therapy too, which allows for the separating of painful thoughts from one's central self through creative engagement. The image is still dead, however. Though it has been externalized from the unconscious, it is not transformative quite yet. It is not healing in the greater context of my gender transition and the absence of a relationship with my sister. There was the possibility for the symbol of death to be transformed into an intermediary between our two differing states of beings, however. How do I connect the symbol of death to my developing life in transition? Um, animation became a solution. Uh, there is some use of animation in art therapy, but it's rather unrepresented um, overall. In Helen Mason's work on her project, Reanimation, Animation in Therapy, she describes animation creating opportunities for therapeutic distancing, the use of metaphor, symbolic expression, and storytelling. When I animated The Mark Left on the Carpet, which is the name of this piece, I focused on the symbolism of the breath, of breathing, this was symbolic of a life lived and a life that continues to live, as this animation is looping and has no discernible end. The animation of this work was transformative and moved it past the original still form visualization that my active imagination uncovered. The expression, the birth of something new, something that connected it both to my living world and her last action, provided a space in which the power was taken away from this particular invasive imagery. It was no longer only a symbol of death, but now was a symbol of transformative and living, but now a transformative and living, breathing object with personhood infused within. I use the term personhood metaphorically here. Uh, since the art object, when animated, provided uh, integral critical distance from its original form. When an externalized artwork such as this has adequate critical distance, that is, uh, the space between you and it is significant enough that it is not directly a part of you anymore, it is able to feed back into the self and change the original meaning. I'll quote Nahmeyer here again. Uh, it gives more authority to the story as something that stands before us and not merely within us. 
It provides an opportunity to gain perspective on an experience by externalizing and then internalizing again. Therefore, a new relationship is formed between the artist and the art because this newly established feedback loop evolves with time. Because this artwork tied my body to my sister's body, I was able to recontextualize the mark's meaning for me. For the remainder of my MFA, I'm still monitoring my ongoing and evolving relationship with the artworks I create, including this one. But the takeaway is that the relationship with them will still evolve. And I have found this way as I transition to connect that with my sister. And I continue to do so. Thank you.